Well, good morning, everybody. We're happy to have you with us with this, uh, for this discussion. We want to uh, welcome all of the guests who are with us this morning and to particularly thank our speakers uh, who will also engage in a discussion with all of you. So I uh, hope you're ready to ask some of those tough questions on a very easy issue. Uh, maintaining, uh, how do we get to peace and stability in Syria and Iraq? Uh, hopefully, uh, they've got some cogent responses for that. But let me uh, welcome back our friend and often co-collaborator on matters relating to peace and security, uh, and especially on the role that women play uh, in this space uh, on issues ranging from Afghanistan uh, to Ukraine. Borga Brenda is the Foreign Minister of Norway. Uh, earlier, he was the Minister for Environment and Trade. Uh, and today, he is here to discuss uh, this really difficult crisis that affects our world uh, in so many ways. And I think everyone would agree that Norway plays an outsized uh, role uh, in the international community, uh, trying as it can to ameliorate the various crises that beset our world. And he has been among the, uh, it has been among the largest supporters of humanitarian uh, assistance, particularly during this refugee crisis, and, uh, and their own country has been impacted by this. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from the foreign minister. Uh, we here at Georgetown at the Institute for Women, Peace, and Security have worked closely with him, and after uh, his remarks, we will be uh, signing a new agreement to do further work uh, on these issues. And because it's nowhere apparent, uh, I hope you will join the conversation on hashtag uh, securing peace this morning and bring others who are not here uh, into this discussion. So without further ado, uh, Foreign Minister Brenda. Madam Ambassador, um, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it feels Really good to be uh, back at uh, Georgetown. It's almost now uh, three years ago we had um, this uh, conference on uh, women uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, Secretary Clinton was there and um, also a lot of other that really cares about um, uh, women in general, but also on, on women in Afghanistan. We followed up on that uh, conference uh, with, uh, I think, a consequential conference also in um, Oslo, inspired by uh, what took place here at Georgetown. Of course, uh, the ambience was not uh, possible to recreate in, in Oslo, but we tried our best. Um, I think the political outcome of it uh, was what we expected. The First Lady, uh, Madame Ghani, uh, was there, and we will, uh, in uh, very few weeks uh, gather in Kabul, where President Ghani, First Lady, and others that really care about uh, Afghanistan and Afghan girls and women uh, will be there. And I, I'm, I'm really looking uh, forward. And of course, we can, in hindsight, uh, have a big discussion about Afghanistan and what has uh, taken place since 2001. But one thing is for sure, that um, on girls and education and some of these issues, we have really seen progress. Uh, there were almost no, no girls in school under Taliban and Al-Qaeda in 2001, and today there are more than four million girls attending school in Afghanistan. That means that four million girls have a future, has an education, and can be part of building a stronger Afghanistan in the future. Of course, there are other challenges uh, that are huge, that I think we can only solve um, in addition to what we're doing on the military side with the political process. But that is another chapter, another uh, conflict, and another challenge. Thank you uh, to Ambassador for your leadership on a lot of very important issues related to women, to 1325, and inclusive peace processes. What we have learned I think from Afghanistan, from South Sudan, and also from the Colombia process, where Norway now is heavily uh, involved uh, as facilitator of the process together uh, with Cuba. We have uh, the discussions and, and 
tough negotiations between President Santos and, and the FARC, but last week we were also able to get ELN in. And what we learned from the processes that we've been running in the Middle East, uh, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, and Colombia, and et cetera, is that the processes need to be inclusive. They also need to involve civil society and women. Because if they're not inclusive, the result will be very uh, unstable and we will not uh, see real results coming out of it. It cannot be um, only some old man sitting in a, a room filled with smoke and agree on something if there is no ownership to the process out in the field. Today we are uh, supposed to address uh, the unfolding crisis and the war uh, in Syria and Iraq. 2012, Syria was a middle income country. If we had been able to agree on what Kofi Annan put on the table in August 2012, we would not have had a situation where more than 300,000 uh, people have been killed. We would not have been in a situation with more than 4 million refugees, 4 million people l leaving um, Syria. We would not have been in a situation where we have and face more than six to seven million internally displaced people in Syria. And we're also seeing um, that this crisis is destabilizing Lebanon and Jordan. I just came from uh, a breakfast this morning with the um, Lebanese um, Minister of Education. Very impressive uh, person, what they have achieved in Lebanon for uh, the children um, that have come from uh, Syria uh, is staggering, but there still is a way to go even in Lebanon. There are 500,000 Syrian refugee children in Lebanon, and only 200,000 of them in Lebanon are attending school. And we are surprised that people in Lebanon, the Syrian refugees in Lebanon, are looking uh, at ways to leave Lebanon and move towards Europe. If we are not able to, in a major way, step up the humanitarian support also to the neighboring countries, uh, this migration pressure will continue and continue. But even worse than the situation, of course, for the children in um, Lebanon uh, and in Jordan is the situation in Syria. In the 21st century, we are in a situation on the border of a NATO country close to Europe where more than 3 million children are not attending school in Syria. It's a lost generation. Uh, this is just illustrating what is at stake. So much had to be done in the coming months to find a political solution to the situation in Syria. And um, uh, in Geneva, they have taken up uh, the um, uh, negotiations uh, this week. Uh, the cessation of hostilities that no one thought was going to work at all when Secretary Kerry took this initiative. He is a very uh, brave uh, man. Uh, he also uh, takes initiatives that a lot of other people don't dare to take. That cessation of hostilities has meant that during these last weeks we have been able to have access to areas that have been under siege and that have not been accessible for a long time. So humanitarian assistance has reached people that haven't uh, seen this kind of support in a long way. The last days I'm increasingly worried, unfortunately, when it comes to compliance with the cessation of hostilities. We are seeing uh, very negative developments around Aleppo, but also uh, around uh, Latakia. So this really shows that the only way to end the humanitarian catastrophe in uh, Syria is to find a political solution. This political solution, in my view, has to include facing out Assad, getting an interim government, new constitution in Damascus where all the groups are part of uh, this government, uh, inspired by kind of a Lebanese uh, constitution. Uh, we need to build on the infrastructure there uh, that is in uh, Syria, that is uh, existing, even after um, five years uh, of war. 
uh, we need to include Sunnis. We have to, of course, they're the majority of the people um, in uh, Syria. We also have to include uh, the Kurds and, of course, uh, the um, Alawites. So a transition period where Assad um, will uh, be exited and that this government uh, will take on more responsibilities. We also have to face and uh, address um, the fact that we will have to accept uh, increased um, uh, regional uh, influence and also uh, we have to delegate uh, more authority to the different regions of uh, Syria. That means also uh, for the Kurdish area, but the prerequisite is that we keep the territorial integrity of the country. Uh, this is crucial. Um, we also have uh, Sunnis that are willing uh, to take uh, responsibility in such a transitional uh, government together with Alawites and Kurds and also Shiites. And, this, and these negotiations now uh, going on also between the US and Russia are of course difficult, but I think there are some common interests between us and Russia in finding political solutions there. I believe we need a non-sectarian government in Damascus. Personally, I would have hope for uh, um, a secular government. Maybe that is hoping for uh, too much, but that is what we should aim for. And also uh, a government that will be able to take on um, uh, governing a country that, w that it will take years to rebuild, really years to rebuild. Built. But we should rebuild it stone for stone. Uh, Palmyra uh, is uh, taken back and I'm, I'm uplifted with the news that it is possible to rebuild this uh, and we should support it um, stone for stone. When it comes to um, ISIL, um, there um, is uh, in, in this international uh, coalition uh, that is uh, making progress. Uh, ISIL has lost uh, around 20% of its territory uh, in uh, Syria, 40% of its territory uh, in um, Iraq. But what we need is to have Sunnis in the lead fighting ISIL. That uh, is the fact uh, in Syria, but is also uh, what is extremely important in Iraq. And I would say that the initiative that the US government took when it came to this coalition against ISIL was a very, very timely and a good one because uh, the U.S. government did it very differently from what we have done before. It started with a meeting that Secretary Kerry called in Jeddah with all the Arab ministers. And all the Arab ministers decided that ISIL is a threat that we have to fight back and that we have to finish. But there were some prerequisites for getting involved in Iraq. One thing was that Prime Minister Maliki had to leave and we got Prime Minister Abadi instead. And why Maliki? Because he was a representative for just one group uh, in Iraq, and we know that it is not possible to take back important parts of the Anbar province with Shiite militia. We have to build on also Sunnis uh, supporting, and they are more than 20% of the population of Iraq. And we are now taken back Ramadi, but we also need to stabilize. People have to feel that they are better off when we uh, take these cities back. And the stabilization funds, the demining initiatives, and also keeping up the pressure on Prime Minister Abadi and the leadership uh, to follow up on debatification laws and also real inclusive governments with the Sunnis is crucial. Without that, we will also continue to fail. So uh, I could continue, I think we, but I, I think we, we should also have an uh, interactive session with the tough questions. But these, these are some of the things I can share about this process. Norway is involved both in Iraq and Syria uh, on the humanitarian side. Uh, we initiated uh, together with UK, Germany and Kuwait the Global Donor Conference for Syria and the neighboring countries in London. Never has there been pledged so much 
resources and money in one day. Never has Norway pledged so much. Our Prime Minister pledged one billion US dollars uh, to Syria and the neighboring countries. Never have we been so clear about children's and women's rights in this context. We said that 15% of this uh, humanitarian assistance should go to education. We are also supporting the Iraqi army when it comes to military uh, capacities and capabilities, Peshmergas and Erbil. Um, we are there. And, of course, we also have to fight ISIL with military uh, means, but it has to be done in a very, very strategic, uh, strategic way. We will later on, uh, Ambassador, uh, also uh, sign a partnership, as you mentioned, agreement with the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. And um, this long-standing dialogue that I mentioned with the Afghan uh, conference uh, is an illustration on this partnership. We will know together, and I'm very excited about this, uh, develop a global index on women, peace, and security. This will be an early warning system with a gender perspective. Too many conflicts have erupted because we failed to see the warning lights that long-term human rights abuses and exclusion of groups represents. The index will also help us to mobilize capable women who are already mediating peace. And what I forgot to say on Syria and Iraq is that we are also involved in Track 2 initiatives and other initiatives to get groups together um, in the spirit of, of Norway. We will also support a study on transitional justice in Tunisia and Colombia um, in uh, this um, of you that we are signing with Judge Sean. Thank you. Well, thank you, Foreign Minister, and, and you've given us lots of uh, food for thought and follow-up. Uh, Stephan de Mastura is the Secretary General's envoy to Syria. Talk about a hard assignment. Uh, he wanted to join us for this discussion today, uh, but with the ever-tentative uh, resumption of the Syrian peace talks and efforts to address bringing an end to this intractable, seemingly intractable conflict and continuing civil war, uh, and finding that political solution that the foreign minister alluded to. Uh, he is on the front line and can't be here, but he insisted uh, nevertheless on giving us an update uh, from, his, um, uh, from his vantage point on this, uh, from the cessation of the hostilities uh, to the um, prospect for the talks and the work that he is doing uh, intensively with the opposition and the formation of the parties of, of that opposition, uh, including his ever intensive work to uh, ensure the inclusion of women. So uh, uh, he had a very, very tough previous assignment in Afghanistan. Many of us worked with him in that space, uh, but this is among the most difficult. Uh, and so we will hear from him and then we'll call on uh, our friend David Miliband. Ambassador Vervia, dear friends, thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry I cannot be with you today because um, um, I'm on my way actually to a uh, tour, a visit to the region which is uh, surrounding Syria and going to Damascus as well. And by the time actually the meeting will be taking place, probably I hope we will be already involved in the next round of the intra-Syrian talks. They are crucial and they are becoming much more crucial because from the first period, the first round of talks which focus on the broad principles, which by the way had clearly indicated the role of women and very specifically at our request and was accepted, 
the 12 points that came out from the first round, and there was one point, in fact, focusing on the role of women in Syria. The next round is meant to be concretely, concretely looking at uh, the actual implementation or beginning of implementation of a political transition. That is what we are looking for, for stopping the war, stabilizing Syria and looking at the future of Syria. Now, when you think about it, there's been still a remarkable change just four months ago. And I must say, in all fairness, thanks to uh, the, the enormous dynamic proactive activities of uh, the Secretary of State John Kerry and his own interaction with uh, uh, the Foreign Minister of Russian Federation, Sergei Lavrov, assisted, helped, supported by us. But there was a lot of energy there, and we welcome that. That's when things happen, when big powers realize that the conflict cannot continue and is devastating everyone and everywhere. Think about what has happened. We have now reached a point when we do have an international support group, 15 countries, co-chaired by Russian Federation, US and the UN, and in that meeting room, which meets regularly whenever we need to actually address the issue of Syria towards the political process, you have Iran and Saudi Arabia, and you've got Turkey and Qatar and the European Union, and most of the countries, actually all of them, who are having a stake in the crisis in Syria. Unthinkable before. And then the next step has been cessation of hostilities. Yeah, imperfect. There are still incidents. There are still people, unfortunately, sadly dying. There are still some incidents, but they are contained. And they've gone down from what it used to be, more than 120 people being killed, many of them women, children, civilians, to probably 70% reduction. We need to maintain it. We need to solidify it. And we need to make sure that it becomes permanent but quite the progress. And the other one, humanitarian assistance. There is a special task force on that. We didn't have it before, where the same countries I mentioned are working every week about how to improve the access. Not enough, still a lot of people, unfortunately, unreached, but from zero, I say zero last year, number of people, now we are more than 278,000 people have been reached in hard to reach or isolated areas. Again, we are not satisfied until all this becomes total and unhindered, but quite a progress. Now, we are looking forward now to the next talks. In the past talks, I am proud and pleased to say that I received a lot of support for the women contribution. We have established a special board called the Women Advisory Board to the special envoy, which is a way through which 12 remarkable women from different backgrounds, Syrian women, have been able and are able to influence me through advice, support, suggestion, papers, proposals. Basically, they become part of my team, and through me, they can influence the actual talks. The delegations are having women. And in fact, I've been insisting to see that happening. And there have been a number of women included in both sides of the discussions, but not enough. And not given enough capacity of intervening. We will be continuing pushing for that. 51% of the population of Syria are women. They have a stake, and particularly now when we are talking about how to end the conflict. There was a woman who was interviewed by uh, a, de a delegation of the UN in the refugee camps uh, recently. She a Syrian woman, and that was in Lebanon. And uh, she was living in a tent with five children. Her husband had been killed, and she was there in that tent, obviously unhappy, waiting to return. But you know what she said uh, to this delegation? And I was quite um, impressed. She said, if the cessation of hostilities continue, if the feeling, just the feeling, that the peace is on its way, you know what I will do? I will take this tent, take my five children, and move back to where the rubbles 
of my home in Homsar and put my tent on those rubbles because I love my country. I will be part and I want to be part with my children of reconstructing my country. That is the message that we need to give to everyone who has a doubt about the future of Syria. And that's why it's so crucial in this crucial moment to have Syrian women crucially involved. And I know that you can help. You have been helping me. You have been inspiring me. And I am sure that uh, thanks to our Norwegian friends and Dutch friends who have been very active in supporting any initiative regarding Syrian women, we will be able to do even more. Thank you and God bless you. And to uh, complete this trio of speakers this morning, we have David Miliband, the former foreign minister of the UK and currently in the very demanding role as president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee, uh, which, as you know, is one of the most preeminent organizations uh, coping with the Syrian refugee crises, among other uh, humanitarian needs. Uh, David has spoken out frequently and forcefully uh, on the need for stepped-up efforts uh, to achieve a political solution. Uh, we all know that that is incredibly uh, the imperative before us. Uh, but also, uh, he has focused on the tragic consequences in a very significant way, the tragic consequences of the refugee crisis. Uh, he is always thoughtful, always visionary, uh, always uh, his perspective is invaluable. And we are particularly pleased that uh, it could work for him this morning to be here to give us that perspective. And I just want to add, uh, to David and, and to our audience that the report that the IRC put out uh, several months ago on the impacts of the um, crisis on the refugees, particularly the report specifically was directed at the state of uh, women and girls and the increasingly uh, horrific consequences uh, with the uptick in child marriage and domestic violence and sexual harassment and uh, other kinds of outcomes. And it is among the many things uh, the humanitarian community and governments are coping with uh, in terms of responding to the refugee crisis. So David, come on up here and then we'll have a discussion. Thanks, Milan. Thank you very much, Milan. Good morning, everyone. Um, Look, it's very humbling to be in front of such a distinguished audience and to have the prospect of um, an inquisition of questions. <laughs> I think I can't remember who it was who said about someone, someone else, but I like to say that um, Milan Vivier is my mentor and in the next 30 minutes is going to be my tormentor. <laughs> I think that was said about someone else in another context. Look, I want to just make, uh, there's one point that runs through what I'm saying, which is about the relationship between humanitarian action and political action. Because it's obvious, I knew this before I became the chief executive of the International Rescue Committee, that humanitarian crisis is born of political instability and political conflict. What I didn't appreciate is that the line of causation also flows in the other direction. Humanitarian crisis and catastrophe sponsors political instability. That's the case inside war zones where sectarianism feeds on itself. It's the case in neighboring states, not just uh, Lebanon and Jordan, but if you think about Kenya, uh, humanitarian crisis sponsors political instability. It's evidently the crisis in Europe. Uh, and a um, uh, humanitarian crisis far away from the United States is sponsoring a lot of political toxicity here. So the line of causation between political crisis and humanitarian catastrophe flows in both directions. And it's in that context I want to just make three or four points. First of all, it's very important to pay tribute to Stefan de Mistura, not just for the vigor with which he's pursuing the political track, but until his arrival as the special envoy, there was an absolutely iron determination to keep the humanitarian questions out of the political talks. An iron divide. Only with the arrival of Stefan Dismistura has Jan Egelen, the head of the Norwegian Re uh, Refugee Council, been brought in as a humanitarian advisor. There was a, uh, I think, very mistaken view until the arrival of Stefan Dismistura that somehow the politics had to be kept in one box and the humanitarian effort kept in a separate box. And because of what I've said about the way political crisis feeds off humanitarian catastrophe, I think that was woebegotten and mistaken uh, view. So credit uh, where it's due. Having said that, 
Syria, 5 million refugees, 4.5 million refugees, 7 million internally displaced. Iraq, 3.4 million internally displaced over the last year and a half. We haven't spoken much about Iraq, uh, but the title of our conference or the title of our discussion is about Syria and Iraq. In total, 23.5 million people in need of humanitarian help in Syria and Iraq together. That means dependent on the international humanitarian system, essentially for survival, certainly for dignity and for survival as well. Now, it's obvious that there are big differences between the situation in Syria and the situation in Iraq, notably in respect of the international support that exists for the governments in the different countries. The international community is relatively united in its support for the uh, Iraqi government. I think I'm right in saying that the Saudis have now established an embassy in Baghdad and the, uh, some of the tension there has been uh, reduced. There's a widespread uh, international support for the Iraqi government. It's perceived to be a less sectarian government than its predecessor, but obviously that, that's not the case in the Syrian uh, context. Um, but I just want to pick out five common elements, similarities between the humanitarian situation in Syria and the humanitarian situation in uh, Iraq, um, because I think that they provide a useful context for our conversation and maybe for the questions that um, follow. And in the end, uh, they provide a test for whether or not the politics is working or not. Point one, there is a war without law in Syria and in Iraq. A war without law is a war that does not respect the international agreements about how wars should be conducted. And um, it, it's tragic, but it's right to say that the pause in the fighting uh, has been uh, surprising and notable. I hadn't heard the figure that Stefan de Mistura used of a 70% reduction in violence, but I, I checked the figures yesterday. 30 health facilities in Syria were bombed by the Syrian government in February this year. Uh, the day before yesterday, the key partner of the IRC, the, the only remaining cardiologist in Hama province, was killed by an airstrike as he came out of a uh, hospital uh, buried in a mountain uh, to, uh, he was killed in a government airstrike. Um, he, he was our uh, only cardiologist partner in Hama. So uh, the war without law continues, and I think it's very, very important, while recognizing the significance of the uh, pause in the fighting, the partial pause in the fighting, not to kid ourselves about what's going on uh, in, in Iraq. Obviously, you've got three million people still under the uh, sway of uh, Daesh, ISIS, so-called, and uh, the, uh, the, there's certainly a war without law there, and uh, if you think forward to the discussion about the future of Mosul, it's a, it makes the uh, discussion about uh, Tikrit or about uh, on the Syrian side of the border, Palmyra, a tea party, frankly, compared to the uh, prospects in Mosul. So, number one, it's a war without law, which rolls back humanitarian progress uh, by decades. Uh, secondly, the denial of access remains uh, profound. I mean, I checked the figures uh, and I stand to be corrected, but young Egeland, who's been drafted in to support uh, Stefan de Mistura, he said that over the last two or three weeks, uh, his hopes for progress on humanitarian access have been uh, sundered, really. He didn't use that word, but uh, have been um, set back. 4.6 million people in besieged and hard-to-reach uh, areas in Syria. Um, besieged means that there's no help for three months. Uh, hard to reach, I think the figure is that for two weeks, it's a, a less exacting standard. Um, but it nonetheless uh, speaks to the denial of food, uh, medicine, and uh, basic uh, support. Three million in hard-to-reach areas in Iraq. So the uh, humanitarian uh, challenge that uh, aid workers who wait f work for the IRC in, Iraq, in Syria and Iraq is profound. There are 2,000 people working for us in Syria at the moment, um, about 300 in northern Iraq. Uh, they face not just danger, but massive difficulty in, co in crossing conflict uh, lines to get aid through. Thirdly, uh, important to say, especially in this context, especially in the presence of Milan, women and girls doubly, triply, quadruply threatened, whether they are uh, IDPs internally displaced within Syria and Iraq, or whether they are refugees in the neighboring uh, states. And it remains uh, a source of shame to me that five years into the Syrian conflict, we're still debating how to measure whether or not services to women and girls are reaching the people that need them. Uh, the lack of accountability in the humanitarian system is built into the system at the moment through the lack of transparency and the lack of clear measurable uh, outcomes for progress. And I think that we've got a real job to do uh, to address that. And if I have time, I'll say a word about that uh, later. Just remember, 75% of the Syrian refugee population are women and girls. Um, so 
the position of women and girls very exposed. Fourthly, no time to talk about it today, but sectarian division in Syria and in Iraq growing. Uh, division, whether physical division, but also um, sectarian um, difference and animosity. And people say, even very um, much more important people than me, talk about the centuries-old Sunni-Shia divide. Uh, there's a political construction here. Sunni and Shia have lived next door to each other in Muslim-majority countries for a very long time. And uh, while it's true that there, has been, that there are differences, confessional differences, uh, it's only in the last, really, the last 15 years that those confessional differences have become such volatile parts of, co of conflict situations. Remember, the Syrian conflict started as a, a conflict between people and government, and it only subsequently became a sectarian division within the country. But that has profound humanitarian as well as political consequences. And then the fifth and final uh, common element between the two countries is that humanitarian heroism is not enough to meet humanitarian need. And the absence, the, the lack of an effective humanitarian system, I always say, or I, I'm beginning to say, there's a humanitarian sector in which diverse agencies are joined by a common sense of mission, but that's not the same as having a humanitarian system that works according to measurable outcomes, that has fundamental and agreed accountabilities in it, that has proper transparency about the way money flows. And the, the, the heroic efforts of the humanitarian sector don't make up for the absence of a humanitarian system that's geared to the modern nature of humanitarian need, which is about IDPs as well as refugees, which is about long-term duration, not short-term emergency, which is about urban displacement, not just camp-based uh, provision. Those are fundamental questions that the humanitarian sector, in my view, hasn't um, yet uh, found the clarity to, 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 to address, in part because of the scale of the need. And don't forget, there are 2.2 million IDPs in Nigeria. Uh, there is a massive uh, challenge in the Lake Chad Basin. Uh, there are real dangers of a combination of El Nino, food insecurity, various other issues arising across swathes of southern Africa. So it's not just in the Middle East that the humanitarian system is challenged. But from my reading, that rather than being an excuse for not reforming ourselves, it's actually an injunction to achieve more effective reform. Um, look, I've had my five minutes, so let me just finish on the following um, point, probably more than five minutes. Um, our job in the humanitarian sector is to stop the dying and it's the job of politics to stop the killing. And those may seem like the same thing, but actually they're different. And uh, one is uh, something that every day speaks to uh, gains and losses. And frankly, when the last cardiologist in Hammer gets bombed by his own government, uh, one can't but uh, be uh, extremely humble about not just the work that we do, but about the prospects uh, going ahead. But stopping the dying requires reform of the humanitarian sector to make it a proper humanitarian system. But stopping the killing requires a more fundamental question about how international responsibility is exercised in the modern world, uh, how institutions can unite uh, diverse uh, countries and uh, interests, and how political leadership rises to the challenge of the time. And so uh, a nice thing to be able to do is to acknowledge publicly the extraordinary role that Norway plays uh, in the world and that Borger you play uh, individually and personally uh, through your uh, commitments but frankly we need more Norways and we need more Borger Brenders. Thank you very much indeed. Well thanks to you both. Um, lots to chew on in, in all of this. Um, I want to say at the outset that we have very limited time. We have a hard stop. Both of these gentlemen have got to get over to the World Bank. We're benefiting from the World Bank meetings, but we're also suffering we from the fact. We're the World Bank. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing this again. Uh, well, this is good practice yeah, uh, exactly. for the warm up. Uh, I want to start, and then I'm going to immediately throw it out because there are a lot of experts in this room, and I'm hardly going to torment. Uh, but I, I do want to ask um, you know, David, you laid out the fact that. The political and the humanitarian are, are intrinsically bound together. Uh, neither of you um, talked specifically about the solution um, that has been worked out. We have yet to see what's going to come of it uh, in terms of relieving some of the pressures on Europe uh, from the refugees uh, in terms of the, the Turkish involvement and the EU plan uh, and all of that. 
Uh, and also, I think it would be interesting to hear from uh, Foreign Minister Brenda, uh, who, as you heard, Norway has been extremely generous in this space, but also been affected in terms of the numbers of refugees you have uh, taken into Norway and what those pressures are like. Uh, so what is your view of this uh, EU plan? Uh, is there the kind of coordination uh, also that's a part of it? And there have been very serious human rights concerns raised about all of this. Uh, and it would be interesting to, to hear from both of you, however you want to start. Thank you. Um, last year, Norway received more than 30,000 um, asylum seekers and refugees. Um, this uh, is a high number for, for Norway. I think that would amount to around 2 million people arriving in the United States uh, of America. So you can imagine that this is something uh, that, of course, we have to handle. We give protection to people that need protection. What we have seen is that uh, many of those that came are also uh, migrants that uh, came to Norway uh, due to social and economic challenges. And this has shown us and again proved that the challenges of uh, Maghreb, uh, Levant, and Sahel are not only challenges for these regions, it's also the challenges for us. Um, it is going to define Europe uh, in the future. Uh, if you're successful uh, in uh, Tunisia, mm -hmm. that I just uh, mentioned, if you're successful uh, in Mali. Um, and uh, what we are now seeing uh, is the result also of the fact that uh, the population in the Middle East has increased by four times since 1950. And in many countries, more than 50% of the population is under 20 years old. So who's under 20 years here? Yeah. So th that adds up to more than 50% of the population in many of these countries. And the same in Africa, four times increase in the population since 1950. And then we will probably have a doubling uh, by uh, 2050. That shows that not only humanitarian assistance, but also very strategic um, development assistance to secure that fragile states don't fail uh, is and have to be on top of our agenda. Europe and the migration piece. Last year, it came uh, more than 1.3 million refugees and asylum seekers to Europe. The challenge is that most of them came to uh, a very few countries. Germany, the Nordics, and the Benelux, and uh, reluctantly, Austria. Um, very low numbers, UK, Spain, Portugal, France, very low numbers. So if Europe is going to succeed in taking responsibility, there also has to be shared responsibility in this. And it's very sad to see that some of the new members of the European Union, for example, the Visegrad countries said, oh, we will take none. And if we're going to take someone, they have to be Christians. I, I'm not kidding. These, uh, it, it is a prime minister in the EU country that is quoted on this. This also shows the challenges. We also seen that um, the migration crisis has led uh, to a rise in anti-immigration movements and parties. Mm -hmm. For the first time in my life, first time in my life, I have seen something no developing in Europe that reminds me so much of Europe's past that I'm not complacent about this and I'm, if we don't get it right, we can see that things from our past can happen also in our future. This is what is at stake. Um, I, I think America cares about this, but I have to say also uh, to my best friends, our closest ally is the United States of America. I have my, uh, some of my closest friends here. It's uh, our best ally. But you know, there is also an Atlantic Ocean between uh, this crisis and the US. Um, we need to get uh, this uh, under uh, control. We need to do more in the different regions. And of course, this EU deal uh, with Turkey is not the perfect deal. Uh, but I, we are not an EU member, but what Norway says, and we take it for granted that the EU, of course, will comply with the international uh, standards and the international uh, treaties that the EU also has signed up to. But 
we also have to factor in this, and then this I see it, say to a lot of, uh, of the NGOs too, we also have to factor in that it is an unparalleled challenge um, in recent time that the EU, EU is facing. So uh, we have to also bear this in mind, and especially um, when uh, you're in the middle of the crisis. I, I was thinking of maybe letting David go first so I could uh, reply to what he's saying. But, uh. so two very quick points. <laughs> One, the European plan is not yet working. That would be the most diplomatic way of putting it. Um, Always the, the diplomatic. The, re the relocation plan to uh, ensure that 160,000 refugees are spread around European countries is not yet working. Less than 2,000 have been relocated. The uh, screening and assessment of people in, in Greece is not yet working with the efficiency that it uh, needs. Uh, the integration part of the uh, plan, which is to ensure that those refugees who are granted the chance to stay in countries like Germany and Sweden uh, are, are engaged and integrated into the local community isn't happening as well as it could. And obviously there's a very, very difficult uh, discussion going on with the Turks. Um, my diagnosis of which is that we are now paying the price of five years of failure, both on the Turkish side and the European side, to advance uh, our own mutual interest. Turkey turned away from Europe after 2010. Mm -hmm. Europe turned away from Turkey after 2010. Mm -hmm. That's why we're in the mess that we're in, or one of the reasons we're in the mess that we're in today. So the European plan is not yet working. The rest of the world isn't helping very much. And those two things are linked. The fact that the U.S. has only pledged to take 10,000 uh, Syrians this year uh, is really um, is not a direct contributor to the European crisis, but it makes it easy for people in Europe to say, well, hang on, the Americans aren't stepping up, the Gulf is not stepping up. Yes, the Canadians have taken 25,000 refugees, which is fantastic. They're the ones showing international leadership. But until we recognize that this is a global problem, not just a European or a Middle Eastern problem, and that it requires an approach to global public goods, because the caring for refugees is a global public good, not just a regional public good, we're not going to be able to get out of this uh, mess. And I think that the fact that President Obama has called a summit for September, a so-called pay-to-play summit, where you only get to come if you're willing to do something, uh, the fact that there's a UN summit. How do you think in, the turnout will be? In, well, I think that people want to have their picture taken with the American uh, president, and they want to be part of um, American leadership and that's the message I can give to uh, Americans which is that you may be sick of international leadership or of being international leaders or some of you may be sick of being international uh, leaders but with um, w with uh, size and with um, political heft comes responsibility and you will not gain you will not enjoy the blessings of globalization unless you bear the burdens of globalization and I think it's obviously an important debate within your country but it's a debate that we can contribute to all right, we have exactly 10 minutes left, uh, so we want to get in as many questions as possible. Who's ready to go first? There's a microphone. There, there's several over on this side and over here. Okay. So we take a few and then we can... Yeah, we'll do that. Hello, sorry. My name is Leisha Thompson, and there's something called the Concordia Summit, which has been happening for the past few years, and it's a link between private and global private and public partnerships. They've been doing a lot of work. Right now they're focusing on human rights and trafficking specifically, but how do you think a summit like this can contribute to the improvement of the situation in Syria and Iran? Well, let's take uh, one over here. Okay. Hello. Um, Former ambassador to Turkey and Iraq, James Jeffrey, has often argued for the creation of a uh, uh, no-fly zone, uh, for, the, for the creation of a safe zone with a no-fly uh, no zone to protect it. Do you believe this is an effective measure to protecting the civilians at risk? Okay, and one more, and then we'll, we'll do another round. Thank you. Sana Mandalini from ICANN. Um, the challenges that you're all raising point to the fact that military solutions aren't working. And yet, when we look at where our budgets are going, we have $1.6 trillion dedicated to the defense and security sector. We have a gap in the humanitarian budget. And we're talking about development and peace building, which is really the crux of this in terms of preventing all the problems that we're dealing with. I'm just curious about where at, and at what point we're going to start skimming, literally skimming from our various security and defense budgets 
to put into the development pot because one fighter jet, which costs one, you know, $185 million, is a lot of money for schools and, and, and uh, education for refugee kids and, and for the peace building work that civil society is doing on the ground. So where is that conversation happening and at what point will we see a shifting of some of those resources? Thank you. Minister, you want to go first, or you, should we go with you first, David? Don't know about the Concordia Summit, so I leave that to my uh, colleague. The um, uh, I think that um, the no-fly zone issue was very pregnant last year, the first half of last year. But frankly, the Russian intervention after September has made it a non, uh, has taken it off the table. Came up in our debates again last um, night. Yeah, I mean, what we, what Stefan de Mistura is trying to do is establish a no-fly zone across the whole of Syria. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, one of the dangers of a no-fly zone in part of Syria is that it somehow, um, it, 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 it almost creates a, a two tiers of uh, civilian safety. Um, now, I'm limited in what I can say on this because I have got people in the field. As far as I can go is to say it, it, that we've got to move the debate about no-fly zones where, yeah, where you are, from, from slogans to details. And the truth is the details matter. What do you actually mean by it? Do you mean a no-fly zone or do you mean a no-bombing zone? I think you mm. probably mean a no-bombing zone. If you mean a no-bombing zone, how is that going to be enforced? Who does it apply to? Uh, the truth is there's only one side that's bombing. Um, there was only one side that was bombing until the, uh, um, the, ISIS, the, the Daesh related uh, interventions that were started um, 18 months ago. Uh, which is, was the first complication. You then had the Russians uh, moving in. But I, I would say that from a humanitarian point of view, uh, you've got to look at the details because we've got experience of no-fly no zones working and we've got no experience of no-fly zones herding uh, civilians into places where they then get killed. So the details really matter. I mean, on your point, I think it's a, a very profound point, not just for the West, uh, but also for um, many countries that are not in the West that are putting money into military budgets, not into um, education and the like. So, it's a good, so you'll like me for saying that, and I don't want to completely lose all the credit I have in the uh, bank, but I do want to say this because I think it's only honest to do so. Uh, Frederick the Great said that diplomacy without arms is like music without instruments. And what he, uh, what he was essentially saying is that the politics and the diplomacy and the development are in part structured by what's going on on the battlefield. And I can't say to you, sit here and say to you that our humanitarian work was unaffected by the fact that one great power got involved in the Syria conflict, but the other one didn't. It changed the battlefield and it changes the humanitarian uh, situation. So I, I would say to you, you're absolutely right to raise the question about the relative priority given to international development versus uh, military. The figure I've got in my head is that 0.013% of global GDP is spent on humanitarian work. I mean, it's a scandalous figure and a really uh, a profound one when you compare it to uh, military spending. Having said that, uh, the balance of power on the battlefield can either enable or disable humanitarian action. And it's only fair to, to say that. You have anything so, to add? Uh, oh, excellent answers. Um, you know, um, to the latter, if we were to establish a, a no-fly zone, that would really mean uh, quite a substantial military uh, um, deployment, not at least from, from the U.S. side. You cannot say that you establish a, a safe zone without um, really uh, then securing uh, safety. We know from Srebrenica and other examples in Rwanda and etc. Uh, you take on a very huge responsibility if you say to civilians that you are safe in this uh, zone. And as David also mentioned, uh, with the Russian um, no uh, stepping up with 50 fighters, uh, three to 5,000 people there, helicopters and etc. Even if they scale down with 40% after the latest uh, speech of Mr. Putin, we, we have a, a clear presence. Uh, what I uh, agree on is that there are, for example, developing countries where they have totally oversized military budgets. Uh, there are countries, uh, I will not uh, name them, but that are using 40% of their budget on uh, the military. And the military is also running a lot of the business in, in the country. And uh, if you have 
uh, taxes that amounts to 10% of GDP. In Norway, for example, taxes are around 35% uh, of, 40% uh, of our, uh, amounting to 35, 40% of our GDP. And where military expenditures are around 1.5% of um, the state budget, while ODA is more than 1%, uh, there is a balance. And I, I think we uh, cannot be in a situation where all those that sticks to the values that we believe in, the human rights, the UN Charter and all this, uh, scale down our military capability and then uh, emerging powers and others that don't care so much about these values uh, step up, then we would really be in a very difficult situation. But of course, I share a vision of a world that is less relying on military interventions and military capabilities, but I'm not in favor of those that are sticking uh, to the values that I hold very dear to me are the ones that are not going to have this capability. Mm -hmm. Sorry for being this candid, but this no, no. Is, is my tough um, uh, view on this, even as a former Secretary General of Red Cross. <laughs> Let me say we have time for one more. So um, this is a hard decision. I guess we'll go back to this side. Uh, you spoke about development and transparency and the U.S.'s effort to modernize recently with President Obama. What are your governments doing internationally and other parts together to make things more transparent? With To make aid? what more transparent? The, are you talking to the mic? Sorry, the aid. Aid more transparent. Yes. Want me to go? Sure. I, mean, I can't speak for a government, obviously. Um, but if, you can speak if only. with your the, frustrations. The, um, uh, the, uh, uh, I think that um, from an NGO perspective, I would say we are extreme. We are required to be extremely transparent. I mean, the requirements on us are very, very uh, significant. Um, what's incredibly frustrating is that different donors have different requirements and different forms to fill in and different accountability mechanisms and different reporting mechanisms, but all of them require great, very high levels of transparency. And so one of the big things, it may sound incredibly sort of minister for paperclips sort of uh, thing to say, but the, uh, one of the big things to come out of the World Humanitarian Summit, which is happening at the end of May, would be for all of the donors to agree on a harmonized set of accountabilities, forms, measures, reporting arrangements. Uh, the, 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 the opportunity to, for the sector to become much more efficient as a result of it and to put money where it's going to make the most difference would be enormously improved by better donor coordination and uh, alignment. And I, I'll David, we've been talking about this for a long time, uh, coordination in, among donors and, and accountability. It seems we don't get off the dime on this. What's well, it going to take? I, I, the, the, my, my impression is that some of the excuses for this are real. So, for example, your political system has congressional requirements about right. the way things work, which are a real, they're a fact of life. There's not, yes. they, they can't get around them. So we, we have, we're managing 650 government grants from around the world, not just from the US, but from all governments. The average length of a grant is 11 months. And this isn't, isn't, it doesn't speak to the fact okay. that the average refugee is out of their own country for 17 years. There's a complete mismatch. There's a, a, a vision of short-term emergency when, in fact, we're in long-term protracted crisis. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm struggling every day with the fact that, one, there are real constraints from the way in which um, different legislative systems work. Secondly, I think that uh, the coordination until now has been much more about implementers' coordination rather than donor coordination. And so that's been the case within donors. So for example, Save the Children is now moving from a situation of having multiple implementing aspects of it. Maybe the same for the Red Cross. They, they, until recently, Save the Children in the US and Save the Children in the UK had different implementing mechanisms. Now they've got a single one so that there's much better coordination within that. So that's happening within organizations, but also the cluster system and other uh, mechanisms for, implementation, for the coordination of implementation were, were happening at the front line. I think there is a new debate sponsored by this high-level panel led by Kristalina Gorgieva for the Secretary General of the UN about humanitarian financing, which says you owe donors have got to get your donations and the way in which they're tracked into a much better place. And then you can demand transparency from the implementers. 
And the implementers need to be NGO implementers, but also UN implementers. Uh, and that seems to me to be really in, uh, important. Uh, in the end, it's about leadership and priority. And I, I think that um, we're at a stage, I don't like to use, I think the word of crisis is overused, but the, 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 the scrutiny of the humanitarian system requires those of us who are committed to humanitarian action to get, get ahead of the, the game. And the, the, the alignment of donor accountability practices is absolutely basic for effective action. Last word. Thank you. Um, as uh, one of the big donors, Norway is also under pressure, not least from our auditors, but also from our parliament, making sure that there is as much transparency and much, as much efficiency and as little uh, corruption and as much accountability as possible with our ODA and humanitarian support. That again leads us to have to develop very meticulous systems for reporting. Not only we need a vision, but we need to follow up, uh, or always on a monthly basis, reporting back on, on the impact, how consequential is the aid and all this. The challenge is when we face protracted crisis, when this is happening uh, in many sectors uh, in a country, that this is also very demanding for the developing country. Um, in, in Tanzania at the Ministry of Finance, um, it was uh, so challenging during the 90s that most of the bureaucrats in the Ministry of Financing, uh, Finance was using their time on reporting back on different um, bureaucratic uh, reports to the donors. So they had different programs and we, uh, and, and there maybe lasted for 10 months, uh, 15 months, and the best brains in the country, best educated at least, were using their time on reporting back. So we need also to make it more simple. We need to make it uh, also, we also have to make sure that there are um, long-term uh, programs. If you have a five months program and a 10 months program, of course, then you put a lot of work into this. But then also there are shifting political uh, priorities. I would say, though, on, uh, not only related to, to transparency, just um, at the end, what, how to use ODA so it as, is as con consequential as possible is the big question. How to make sure that ODA brings one country from being a poor country to become a middle-income country. What are those programs? Mm. That's one thing. The fragile state things is very challenging because what I said to the Norwegian parliament, if you want us to go into Mali, go into Somalia, go into Sudan, go into uh, doing more business in, in Afghanistan and Yemen, these are countries with weak governance systems. They are countries that are in a situation where there's a lot of corruption. So there is risks related to these projects. So don't be surprised if we find out that not all the money has gone to what we uh, planned. But what is the alternative? To just stay away and uh, don't support this so they become totally failed states and not only fragile states. We also have to be realistic and communicate in a very, very honest way. And my last point where we have now stepped up is to build more resilience and also better governance systems. That's why I have launched this program of, uh, together also with my predecessor, tax for development, how to create a tax system in a country so the governmental rent goes to the people of the country and not only those that are uh, oligarchs and, and uh, uh, bring the money out of the country. Oil for development is the same thing making sure that the natural resources is used in favor of the people of the country and the taxes and the revenues are invested in education, fisheries for development, building strong systems so you also can develop um, management for fisheries that is sustainable. These kind of governance systems, building resilience, building stronger governance um, structures in a country, this is something I strongly believe in. Thank you. Well, thank you both. You know, we talked a lot about leadership this morning and the leadership that's required in terms of dealing with the theme of this morning. But I think um, all of us would agree that the two of you demonstrate our good fortune that you're in the positions you're in. Uh, you're both visionary, 
committed, uh, always looking at innovative ways to get these hard things done, solution focused. Uh, so thanks to you both, and we will send our thanks to Stefan Di Mastura, wherever he is at the moment, uh, and wish him Godspeed. But I cannot thank both of you enough, and I think we will have you out on time to be at the World Bank. Thank you. Your next appearance. Thank you.